pleasant good day, everyone, and welcome back to another conversation in our series, looking at um, all the stuff that we've been talking about, of course, in equity, diversity, and inclusion, and look and examining so many things that are related to us in our education system and how we can ensure that our space is more welcoming, more inclusive, but also that our students feel a sense of belonging and not just feel, but know they belong into our schools. And of course, how those kind of um, issues impact learning, student achievement, and impact the board and the schools, our schools as a whole. Today we wanna to jump into another topic and a final conversation about becoming a champion for equity, diversity, and inclusion. We started our conversation looking at fostering and creating and, and sustaining belonging, making sure that our students, staff, and educators feel that sense of belonging. And then we dive right into the idea of growing in cultural competence. And the, ra the rationale behind that is that as we grow in cultural competence, we become more understanding, we become more aware, we become more respectful, we become global citizens, truly global citizens, right? Because we are aware that differences exist outside of ourselves, outside of our lived experiences, outside of what we know as, as, as correct or normal or acceptable, and being open to the differences around us. So that's why that is so powerful. And we talked a lot about actions. Well, today is gonna be, the, this conversation I would say is a conversation that really calls us into action. And I use that term, it is calling us in to action. And that is thinking about being a champion for equity, diversity, and inclusion, being a champion for change, being a champion for social justice, being a champion for for, for racial justice, being a champion for those who are marginalized, pushed aside and excluded, being an ally. And we're gonna unpack that word quite a bit today because we have used it quite a bit. And we know that we have work, we have work to do on that. So when it comes to thinking about becoming a champion, we wanna talk about you know, the fact that we all need to be more inclusive, all of us, all of us. We all need to grow. There are so many things that we still need to learn and to unlearn. Um, we have to show more empathy and kindness and also doing the things that says, I see you. So as we engage in our conversation, again, we're going to be calling upon all of us to engage in a courageous conversation. We're going to call upon all of us, again, to think about our leadership, and when I say leadership, I'm not talking about principals and superintendents and directors, I'm talking about each and every one of us. Each and every one of us leading into our various spaces. As a matter of fact, leading in our homes. Leading even in our homes, how do we do that when it comes to thinking about conversations around equity, diversity, and inclusion? The other day I did a talk with parents, um, parents, and I the topic was, inclusion begins at home. And I focus the idea that as parents, we are leaders in equity within our own homes. And so I want you to, to understand that. We are again talking about our personal biases and prejudices and how they play a part. Looking at the patterns of inequalities and injustices in our community. When you see these things around you, how are you feeling? I remember Last year, we got up one morning. I'm sure you remember that. And the number 215, we were greeted with the number 215. We were greeted with the number of, bought, of graves of indigenous children found. And I asked myself, that very day that happened, the, the next day, the couple of days, I looked around and I, and I saw how we were reacting, including myself, including myself. How were we reacting? How were we responding? How were we impacted or affected? What were we, what were we feeling? And after those feelings, those tears that many of us cried, those days of solemn 
where we where we sat in silence because we we our empathy and our imagination was so powerful to think that children being sent to school to learn were murdered. And I, I just want to pause here for a minute because one of the problems we have is that I think we like to circumvent and 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 and, and tiptoe around the concepts and the ideas. And we try to explain them away and not be honest. Like, like I said this before, I have seen so many persons want to talk about anti-Black racism, but they don't want to talk about the barriers. They want to talk about, you know, inclusion, but they don't want to mention 2S LGBTQIA+, which are students in our schools, right? They exist. We want to talk about First Nations, but we don't want to talk about truth and reconciliation, or we want to talk about truth and reconciliation, but we don't want to talk about the injustices. We want to talk about um, 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 issues up into certain racialized community, but we don't want to talk about Islamophobia. We don't want to talk about homophobia. We don't want to talk about anti-Black racism. We don't want to talk about police brutality. We don't want to use certain language like white supremacy. When we are so cautious, about facing the issues, let, let us ask ourselves, will we then act? So that very day when we heard about 215, the number of indigenous bodies, children that were, that were that the graves found, you found that a lot of persons didn't want to use the word murder, that indigenous kids were murdered. You found that people didn't want to use that language. We have to be honest when it comes to having these courageous conversations. We have to unpack them. And one of the things to do is to be honest about how do we approach a courageous conversation? What are the truths that we've been told? Right now, we are still in the space where a lot of you are hearing the terminology decolonization of education. What does that mean? What does that mean? If we're gonna have a conversation about decolonization in education, what will that sound like? What are the language we're gonna use? Are we gonna, or what are we gonna talk about, about colonizers? What are we gonna say about Christopher Columbus? What are we gonna say about the British empire and the French empire? What are we gonna say? Are we gonna be honest about what really happened? Or we are going to still do things that we were we were taught growing up as a child that Christopher Columbus discovered the world, and if it wasn't for Christopher Columbus, we'd have been barbaric and we have not known anything. And so I want to pause here as we have this conversation about ways to address power and bias and prejudice and impact and perceptions and actions. I want us to center this conversation in the fact that we are going to have honest conversations about the inequities within our schools because they are real. So why do we need champions? We're gonna to get to that in a minute, but I wanna I want to also share another story with you. I like to share my stories. I was in a school, TDSB. I used to work for the Toronto District School Board. And as an LTO, I went to one school in a certain area and I was shocked at the state of the classroom. I was in a grade one classroom this classroom, this school was in a predominant white, black and Hispanic area in Toronto. And I walked into the classroom in grade one and the children had about 21 decks and chair. There was an book, an old bookshelf with a few torn books. There was a cupboard for teacher supply that had nothing in it except some old leftover stuff from, clearly it was a kindergarten class. And it was just bare, it was bare. And I taught at that school for four months, did my, did my magic, you know, showed what I need to do and do what I need to do. And then I went to a school in another neighborhood, 25 minutes away. That school had every single technology. Those kids had Chromebooks. We had a computer lab that we could access anytime. And we had carts with iPads. In my class only, we had Chromebook, a computer lab, and we have cart with iPads. Same school board, 25 minutes away. The other school, I had to run to the dollar store for many trips to get stuff that I needed for that, for those children. And the other school, I had every single thing I needed, plus, plus, plus. My, my teacher supply room looked like 
Walmart. And I'm not exaggerating. Everything I needed was in that storeroom. So we have to ask ourselves. So here is where we want, we want to start this conversation. How are you reacting to the patterns of inequities showing up into your school? So when we say we need a champion, I want to ask you, who is a champion? When I ask you to be a champion, I'm saying to you, I'm speaking to you today to be a champion for equity, diversity, and inclusion. When I say to you, be a champion, what am I saying to you? What am I calling you for? What am I calling on you for? I am saying that you are a person, we are persons who fight or argue for a cause or on behalf of someone else. And when I Google the word and use my dictionary to find the word, you know, champion, I found many words. I found the word advocate, proponent, promoter, supporter, standard bearer, torch bearer, flag bearer, defender, protector, upholder, backer, sponsor, prime mover. And I love this last one, pleader for. We want you to understand as educators, I want you to understand, us to understand as educators, it is our role. When we say we have children in our care, how do we deal with all these children? And I always use a phrase I love, other people's children. How do we take care of other people's children? How, it, how do we take care as leaders of our staff? How do we take care of our team members? How do we ensure that those on the team who do not feel a sense of belonging, who do not feel a part of the team, who do not feel that they are respected and appreciated and their, their ideas are brought forward. How do we pull those persons forward? How do we do that? We have to ask ourselves these questions. How do I become a champion for equity, diversity and inclusion in my school? And so we won't be going over these slides that much, um, I, I rushed through these to just to lay a foundation, you know, of equity and the definition of equity. I'm sure there are, there are many different definitions, and I choose some of these definitions just to give you a basic underline, um, a condition of state fair, inclusive, respectable treatment. And the idea here is that we, we think about individual differences. And that is why we are moving away from the conversations around equality, because equality says, let's give all these three kids one apple each. That's what equality says. Equality says, everybody deserves one apple. Equity says, well, this child is allergic to apple, so he don't need an apple. This child actually, because of certain circumstances, he may, she or he may have missed breakfast, and may ask for an extra apple. We can give this particular child two. Another child may, may say, I don't need an apple because my mom owns the upper orchard. Another child may, 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 may be a part of the dynamics and they don't need an apple either because their parents own the store that we bought the apple from. I want you to understand that individual differences, and we talk about it in education, we talk about accommodations, we talk about um, um, extensions and, who, and how we deal with children and modifications, universal design for learning, multiple ways of expression, multiple ways of knowing. When we get these philosophies and ideas and theories and concepts in, in, you know, in our system, we have to know then, we have to then decide how do we demonstrate them? Because I think many of us as educators, we are not, well, not think. I know that as educators, we are not lacking in the ideas and the concepts and the theories. We are not. We are absolutely not. If you ask an educator, what do we mean by modification and, and, and one size does, it not, does not fit all? And what do we mean by um, 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 giving a student an extension? What do we mean by accommodation? What do we mean, what do we mean by inclusion? What do we mean by universal design for learning? What do we mean by differentiated learning? We will get it. We, we know what it is. We can define it. We can write it. The problem is, are we living it? And that is a tension that we are having in education. We see a lot of persons doing. We see a lot of persons reading. We see a lot of persons writing, publishing, designing. But what we are missing out on is the living. 
<laughs> you know, and, and as a Catholic school, as a Catholic board, I love the opportunity that, that I have to bring in my own Christianity and how I was brought up. And I, I think I've shared before that I taught at Catholic schools in the Bahamas for years. So I, I have been a part of this environment where I worked in a Catholic school for years as, an, as a teacher. And, you know, we used to sing the song, you know, then my living shall not be in vain. Then my living, how is your living? How is your work, your actual actions? And so we think about that. And the idea that one size does not fit all, we wanna make sure we understand that. And then of course, diversity is a conscious. What I love about this definition is the word acceptance. It's the conscious acceptance, belief and recognition that differences exist. We have to understand that differences, they do exist. No matter, what, no matter how we try, and we have seen where people are erasing identities, but if you erase my identity, that doesn't mean I'm, I, I'm non-existent. <laughs> I'm still here. You just have erased my identity. You just have made me small. You just have made me insignificant. You just have taken away my value. You have taken away my seat at the table. You have taken away my voice and my presence. But I'm still here. I am still here. And so we have to come to that grips. And of course, inclusion. I love this word as well, conscious. Conscious behavior and action. Conscious behavior and, behavior and action to, to ensure that we authentically include people. So when, if we were in person together, we'd have done this activity. And the activity I ask us is to, to discuss with each other, share with each other, why do we need champions in the work of equity, diversity, inclusion, social justice, racial justice? Why do we need champions? Why? Why do we need champions? Ask yourself that question. Why do I, when I, why do I need to be a champion? And why do certain students, why do they need champions? And so I've done that in, in my many workshops. And I'm, of course, I would love for you to write your list and to share with your team, with your staff, with your partner, with your family, with your students. This is a very good activity. I always encourage teachers to, when you talk about empathy, you talk about friendship, you talk about kindness, you talk about, you have discussion about bullying school. I say to them, think about that. Let's ask our students why. And so in many spaces, I ask the questions and these are some of the amazing responses I have had when people say, why do we need champions? And we see, we see so many things. And I want you to take a minute to look at, at, at some of the responses. I love that one at the bottom down there, it takes a lot of hands to do hard work. I love that we have recognized that this is heavy lifting. I love the idea that role models for people to look to, to ensure resources and opportunities are available. And I know as you're watching this video, you are seeing different things. Your eyes are pulling you to different parts. I love when I see to erase stigma. It's a big one for many persons, especially persons in certain areas, if, if, especially if you identify as a refugee, you identify as you know, somebody who is, who is HIV positive, somebody who is um, um, uh, um, a twist LGBTQ, someone who, is, who has certain mental issues, right? Um, and concerns, you know, the stigma that comes with that. I can see that and I can, you know, I can look at lists of people who have been champions for causes. And I know you know champions. I know if you look around your school right now, you will be able to identify champions and champions for different issues and different concerns. Because we're not all going to be champions for everything. That's impossible. We cannot be champions for everything, right? Another slide I show you. And again, we see the word example coming up. Again, I see the word stigma. And these are diff these were done by different groups at different parts and diff sorry, at different times. We see leadership here, quite a bit of leadership. We see about we see the word representation. My eye goes, my eye goes to representation. We talk about building trust here. I see one that says to address and break down fear. I see one that says to challenge 
the current status quo? Who is going to do that? Who is going to challenge? There are so many things that I, that I challenge today that I ask myself, and I do you know, ask myself, did anybody, any one of my teachers at that time thought to challenge it? And if they thought to challenge that, what were those barriers? What were those things that kept them from challenging those things? The last one, I'll share to you one more. One more for you, for us. And I like this one. I like the one that I see it as somebody says, to inspire, to inspire. And I see on this one, there's so many sharing about the need for change. And the idea that students feel safe and welcome. I love this one that says to inspire again. And I, I see the word inspire, inspire again. But I love this one at the top. It says every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. Mm. I want to rest on that for a minute. Every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. I want you to pull close to the laptop. Let's pull close to the video. And I want to read that again, not for you, but for us. For us, for myself as well. Every child is one caring adult away from being a success story. Wow. I love this quote. I really am impacted by this quote today. Yeah, I'm impacted by this quote today. Am I that caring adult? And so when we think about champions, what we do, we come to one of our truths we talked about earlier. And we understand, I'm sure many of you have seen this, this picture before, and there are many, many variations of this picture. And we talk about equality, equity, and the reality. And so when we have those slides, the same slide we just showed before, it's also a, a representation here to say, what is happening in our school? What are the fences in your school? Who is unable to see the game in your school? And what are those boxes? So when I do a, 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 a workshop here, we talk about the fences, the boxes, and the, the, the block of vision, the barriers to seeing the game. And I want you to ask yourself as an educator, which student in my school, in my class, is unable to see the game? What are the fences in our school board in our policies, in our practices? What are the barriers in our, what are the fences in our curricula? What are the fences in, in, our, in, in our activities? I shared something with someone the other day and they looked at me shocked because I've worked in school boards now that it's mandatory for all children to go on field trips. And what we, what we mean by mandatory is that if a child cannot afford a field trip, then the school has to provide for that child to go to this field trip. And then I told you know, a group of teachers growing up in Jamaica and growing up you know, poor, the number of field trips that I couldn't afford. And I will never forget, <laughs> I will never forget that I've gotten field trip papers to take home to my mom. And I just didn't give it to her because I was smart. I was nine, 10, and I know, you know we were struggling and I know she didn't have a field trip money to send me to field trip. I didn't even, I didn't even bother her with the field trip. I just throw away the paper. And for me as a, as a child, I thought that was okay. And as a teacher, understanding the dynamics, I realized how bad that was. And as a child, in, as a child who was nine or 10, I made decisions about my own learning like that. And since I became an adult, I realized no child should have to make those decisions. No child should have to have those conversations with themselves. Do I take this home to my mom so she could be bothered? Do I take this home to my mom or my dad, 
you know, so they could be bothered. And I use my mom because, of course, I used to take field trip papers home to my mom. My dad is a taxi man. He didn't see the field trip. He came in very late. And I love my dad. We had a, had a beautiful, you know, experience with my growing up with my parents. But my dad struggled as well financially as a, as a taxi operator. And I'm sharing this with you. I don't even know why I went there, but I felt the need to go there for us as educators to understand the context which our students are coming to school with. And I know so many teachers who cannot, cannot relate to my story, what I just shared with you. Cannot, because you have never had to, you have never had to decide, do I go on a field trip as a child? Because you take it to many parents pay for it. And as an educator, that's why I share the story. I want you to center yourself in the privilege that you have. As, as an educator, I want you to center yourself in the privilege that you have and understand why we call upon you to be a champion. Why we call upon you to be an ally. Why we call upon you to be a co-conspirator. Why we call upon you to raise your hand and to speak up and to speak out because the children in, in your care do not have that kind of currency. Do not have that kind of voice. They don't have that access and that advocacy. And not to say children, but if you're a teacher at the university level, the college level, you have to realize that the students in front of you, your peers, your adults in front of you as well, do not have the kind of agency that you have. Ask yourself, the people that I work with, the people that I serve, the people that report to me, the students in my care, do they have the same kind of agency that I have? And they don't. And today I think about the kind of agency and access and ability and power and privilege that I have. And I want you to realize when I call upon us to be champions, I am asking you nothing strange or weird or overextend of yourself. It's about how do you ensure that if you have <clears throat> access to good drinking water, that everybody else in your space should have the same access. And if you see somebody being offered dirty water, you have to open your mouth and say, that water is dirty. And I'm telling you right now, I'm, you know, this is, what, this is why I'm, I fight so hard. This is why my passion drains and, and pulls so hard because I see so many of us. I've sat down, we sit down in our privilege and our power and we could do something. Our pens are powerful. Our teaching is amazing. Our schools are amazing, but we do not enact. They are the amazingness. And so we, we have our children who, who don't feel a sense of belonging. Our kids who are struggling to find space, struggling to see the game, struggling to be to able to see over the fence, struggling with the number of boxes offered to them. But what we want, if we want to get to a place of liberation, and I want to ask you a powerful question. In your school, in your school, in your class, what does liberation look like? This is a question I want us to reflect on as we think about ourselves as educators, as champions. We are called to be champions. And even if you don't want to answer the call, I have to go here. Even if you don't want to answer the call, I want you to understand that the children in your care, the people in your care need champions. And because you have the power, I want us to rise up. There are too many of us, too many of us have had too many missed opportunities to speak up, to speak out, to defend, to disrupt, to dismantle, to, inter, to interfere, to interject, to reject, to call out, to call in. Too many of us have had too many missed opportunities. And I can tell you, I have had those as well. 
And I look back at some of the, my history and I realize that was a missed opportunity. So right now I try my best to seize opportunities to make sure I be, a, be that champion. And so one of the things we want us to spend a little bit, little bit, little time discussing is the word allyship. And I definitely want us to read. So, so I love this quote from Kendall 12, 12, 20, 20, you know, 203, 2003, sorry. One of the most effective ways to use our privilege is to become an ally for those on the other side of the privileged seesaw. And if you Google privileged seesaw, you will see that, that, that graphic you know, about the privileged seesaw. Something, it's something really to, to Google and see. It's quite interesting. Um, the privileged seesaw, right? How do we, how do we, how do we um, interact as, 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 as educators? This type of alliance requires a great deal of self-examination. And this is why I call upon all of us. This, now you understand why I'm so big on self-examination. Because it's different if I say to you, hey, there is an a, 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 a imbalance. There is a privileged seesaw. And I have to explain that to you. I don't want to have to con constantly explain that to you. I want you to understand, become aware, increase your awareness of how privilege and power is, is enacted in our schools, in our classrooms, and who is denied? Where is the lack? Where is the marginalization? Who's, who is being excluded? Whose voice is not, is not being heard? I want you to be that person who picks that up easily. You are sensitive. You are awake. You are tuned in. You know, Black folk says you are awoke. I like to say you are tuned in. That's my word. You are tuned in. And of course, the willingness to go against the people whom you share privilege and status with so you can do the work that is necessary. Allyship, this comes from the Tri-College Libraries. Another definition, allyship is a process and everyone has more to learn. My hand went up first. And I'm not putting up my hands for you to feel cute or comfortable. I'm putting up my hands because if you have watched videos, and I've been into my workshops, you will see how many times I share stories about my own missteps, about my own misunderstandings, about my own unconscious bias, about my own assumptions, about my own stereotype and how those things have impacted relationships and how I've worked to earn amazing relationships. How I've worked to make sure my students know, I see you. That was an error. And are we going to fix it? Because at the root of this work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, the root of this work is, at the root of this work is relationship. And so allyship is a process and everyone has more to learn. Allyship involves a lot of listening. Sometimes people say doing ally work are acting in solidarity with, to reference the fact that ally is not an identity. It is an ongoing lifelong process. And so I want us to understand that. And here again, I just wanna share more opportunities with, with you. And I like the idea that the word ally, you know, been used loosely. This, this quote came to us from guidetoallyship.com, a very nice website, um, guidetoallyship.com. You could check it out, guidetoallyship.com. And it talks about what you do, the work. I like the second quote. It says here, we need people to do this even if they cannot fully understand what it's like to be oppressed for their race or ethnicity, gender, sexuality, ability, class, religion, or other marker of identity. And that's why I always go to kindness and empathy and love, because these are the underpinnings of great allyship. And so when we think about allyship, we think about convenient allyship. Now that's what you need to stay away from, right? You know, a lot of people are, 
convenient allyship. And convenient allyship, it's marked by grandstanding and personal rewards. You're doing this because somebody's going to see you. You're doing this because you'll get something else. You're doing this because you'll be on a committee and people see you in a picture that you are on the committee. And yeah, you know, we have that kind of white savior mentality. And so let me do this because it's convenient. Or like I usually use this story. I know people who have been a part of uh, marches. Uh, and the only reason why they're part of it was that they were in the neighborhood when the march was happening. They said, oh, they're marching against Black Lives Matter. Let me go join the march as well. I mean, they did march, let's give them credit for that, but it was convenient. The next one we look at is the performative. And especially in a time of social media, especially in an area on a day of social media, we see a lot of performative allyship, right? We see a lot of persons just tweeting and posting. And a lot of persons feel like if I tweet, or I post, I have done my duty. And, and the truth is, let me be very frank, keep on tweeting, keep on posting, keep on sharing, because I can tell you of a fact that it brings awareness in many spaces. It brings knowledge and information and oh, wow, oh, okay, I didn't know that, in many spaces. I have seen a lot of people, including myself, tweet something or post something or share something and many persons end up using it and go, wow, I didn't know this. I didn't know this. Many persons don't know when it's Indigenous Day. They don't know when it's Truth and Reconciliation Day. They don't know when it is Ida Hut. They don't know when it's International Day, International Day Against Homophobia. Uh, they don't know when it's, it's, it's pride. They don't know when it's indigenous month. They don't know when it's Ramadan or whatever. And so tweeting those things and sharing those images, it's actually powerful. So I'm not saying you're not supposed to do it, but if that is all you do, if that's where your allyship begins and ends, well, we're not doing much, right? <laughs> we have to do more than that. And so we also have optical allyship very, very surface, you know, you're doing it and it's, it's what everybody's doing. And so you show up just to be there and in the space. But what we want for all of us is true allyship, true allyship. I want us to really think about how do I become, how do I work at being that true ally? What does true allyship look like for me? And so one of the activities we would have done, of course, and I want you to consider doing is what are some of those do's and don'ts? And it's not to chide anyone, it's not to correct anyone. It's because every time I go into a workshop and people come up, we talk about allyship, I always have people asking, what are those things we shouldn't do? And that is a good question. It's not a bad question, it's a great question. What are those things that we, we, we should ensure that we don't do? A lot of things we should ensure that we do. And so I always ask us to jump into a chat, you know, jump into a jam box, go a jam board, sorry, go into our groups, whether we do a brainstorming activity or whatever, or sharing. And you see, and this is also from an amazing website as well. Um, I, I shared you earlier, um, the guide, um, allyshipguide.com, a very, very, very good. And the first one is the, the, the listening, the do's. And as you see it here, you see the list of do's. What am I doing? Ask yourself, how am I doing? I, I, and I, like, I like to make a joke and I said, how, how, how am I doing my do? <laughs> what, what, is, what does my do look like, right? And so we see a lot of listening. We see a lot of accepting of criticism. I have been in spaces where people have been angry. And as the messenger, they have been angry at me and I have to sit in that discomfort and allow people to express themselves. I've learned how to do that because people are at different stage, at different stages of the journey. And so sometimes we have to listen we have to walk away realizing that when you're a leader on a team, I've learned that, that I have a, I'm a black man. 
But I also realize that I do take up certain spaces that will allow me to, to experience certain criticism. I am on a leadership team at the university that I work at, the Master of Teaching program. I have been a director of education for a private college for three and a half years. I know what it is for students to say, you did not, you were a part of. And I've had to sit into that criticism. We have a problem, I see it happen a lot, that when we are doing the work of equity and, and, and we're growing and once somebody criticize us, we get, burdened down and we are like, oh my God, I was trying to save the world and now you hurt my feet and we cry. We center our own discomfort. I've seen it happen a lot. I'm sure you have heard people talk about white tears and some of you may be offended by somebody using the term white tears or white woman tears. It's a reality. I've seen it demonstrated that we're talking about something and somebody starts to cry because of how they may feel. And all of a sudden, we are distracted by the tears. And instead of discussing the marginalized, instead of discussing the persons who are hurting, we have now spent the next 20 minutes addressing somebody's tears. That's how we talk about fragility a lot. And not just white fragility, but fragility on a whole when it comes to this work. And so what are the don'ts? I focus a lot on the do, you hope you realize that, because I want us to focus on what do we do. And you see the don'ts. And one of those big ones is number two. Do not participate for the gold medal in the oppression Olympics. There's a lot of work for us to do. There are many groups and many portions of people who are hurting. And not because we're talking about anti-Black racism, we forget about anti-Indigenous. Not because we're talking about Islamophobia, we forget about anti-Semitism. Not because we're talking about homophobia, we forget about gender issues. Not because we're talking about newer diversity, we forget students who have certain physical disabilities and mental health. All. Of, of those persons and people and spaces need our advocacy and our championship. So I close with asking you a question. And the question is very simple. What is your role? In the work of, that we are doing, I trust and hope none of us take on the position of being racist and sit in our prejudice and our bias or we be a denier, you know, Canada is not like this. You know, we hear it a lot. Well, this is not Canada, this is Canada. We don't do this. And there are a number of persons who had no idea that slavery existed in Canada because we don't talk about that. Many persons we don't realize, we see it on TV, police brutality on TV with, 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 with a black population, but we don't talk about it here as if it doesn't exist. Are we denying? Are we going to be a bystander? Miss opportunity, pretend a box checker. But what I want for us to do is to be that ally, that actor, that advocate, that activist, that accomplice. And I'm sure you have heard the word being used a lot lately, the co-conspirator. But don't be in a rush to take on a new title. Don't be in a rush to take on a new title. Don't be in a rush to just take on, oh, I'm an accomplice. Oh, I am I a co-conspirator. Be in a rush to do the work. And I close with this. Remember your actions to promote inclusion within your organization must be intentional and deliberate. Your actions to promote inclusion within your school, your board, your classroom, your group must be intentional and deliberate. Thank you for engaging these, in, these, uh, um, 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 in this series. I know you're using the reflection form to talk about things that you are learning, things that you're unlearning, questions you may have. I want you to go to that form and put the questions in the form. You know the form we're talking about if you're part of the, 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 this, the board. 
and those things that you're wondering about and those things you're struggling with, I do not promise you. I have not promised you that I'm going to give you the answer. But I promise you that we, we can work on the answers together. And the answer in your board may be a different answer in another board. The concern you have here may be dealt with differently over here because of context and people. What is a struggle for you today may not be a struggle for you next month. What may be a question you have today may not be a question you have come September or come fall or come winter. And the thing that you are unlearning today may not be something that you need to unlearn ever again. And the thing that you are learning today about equity may be the very thing that you are able to teach in a couple of weeks, couple of days, couple of hours from now. I want us to respect that we are on different parts of the journey to get this work done. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for engaging. Thank you so much for being a part of this learning journey with me. And this is just the start of the journey. I'm sure you know this is just the start of the journey. Thank you.